At Convoy of Hope, our team is passionate about feeding one million hungry children around the world each day at school. We're already about 40% of the way there. Imagine how many thousands of children are smiling over a warm bowl of nutritious food, even as you watch this video. Convoy of Hope's Feed One initiative is a primary force for making this happen. Feed One was born out of a harsh reality. Several years ago, Convoy of Hope was feeding children at about a thousand schools in impoverished communities. But many more children were standing outside the fences of the schoolyards and they were peering in. And those children were still hungry. They were the ones that were begging in the streets, the ones who were scavenging off of garbage heaps. And I remember the day I was driving my car and I was desperately praying for a solution. I said, God, we need a way to get these kids inside the fence. And as I was praying, the phrase, feed one, flashed in my mind. Feed One continues to welcome children inside the fences of our program schools. I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, because of you, additional schools are being added regularly. The goal of feeding one million children, it's attainable. And your help is getting us closer every day. So thank you again for partnering with Convoy Hope through Feed One. What you do today, with your compassion, your ideas, your creativity, it can transform generations and help children break free from the cycle of hopelessness. So next week, we are doing something brand new. How many people are ready for a brand new thing? Ready? Yeah. Come on. Kingdom Builders is launching a brand new initiative. I'm so excited about this, is that our desire as an entire church family is to feed 1,000 children a year. And I'm asking, to me, I'm trying not to make this a whole sermon right now, but to me, it's what true Christianity is all about, right? James says, pure religion, real religion is taking care of the orphans and the widows, and it's the heart of God. And we're going to do this on Mother's Day, so always a great time to launch this. We, we've done something similar in the past, but this is brand new. And we're just asking next week, a thousand children, it's like 120 bucks a year, we're asking God to just... Lord, break our hearts for the people that break the heart of God, right? And so that's next weekend, Mother's Day. And let me just take a shout out for Mother's Day, one of my favorite Sundays of the year. Come on, all the ladies in the house. What I love about Mother's Day, all the moms can be the evangelists of the day because you can make your kids be at church. Come on, right? You're coming to church with me. That's what you're doing for Mother's Day. And so I'm uh, very excited about next week. And I always love, honestly, there's four or five, well, I love every Sunday. Is that fair, right? But Mother's Day is just always a very, very, very special time. Well, what we're doing today is we are jumping back in. If you're newer to New Life, we are jumping back into our year-long series called the Apostle Paul. Okay? And, and I'm very excited about this. We're going to jump in. Paul is like this, this um, major apostolic voice of the New Testament. And I would argue you cannot really understand what Jesus did without the Apostle Paul. He came on the scene and said, the cross and the resurrection mean something for all of us. And Paul, Paul helped us realize that the gospel is not only for the Jewish people, but uh, this is huge, this is huge. The gospel is for anyone and everyone. That, that even, even for those Gentiles, those sinners, come on, how many people, that's all of us, right? non-Jewish people, that the gospel, my friend, is for you. And this is so big as we jump back into the Apostle Paul, I'm praying that every new lifer, those online right now, locations, I don't care where you're at, how many people know we need to be at church, right? Come on. That, that you would allow the message of the Apostle Paul, especially today, come alive. Because Paul helps us understand, he truly helps us understand why this is good news. So here's what I do. To frame it, we're going to land in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 here today. But I want to frame it with this question. This is a question that um, I got saved when I was a teenager, so I wasn't raised in church. And when I got saved, when I gave my life to Christ, radically saved by the grace of God. And one of the questions that early on, I remember being 15, 16, 17, and in my Bible college days training for ministry, asking myself this question. And here's the question, it's kind of a brutal one, but this, well, why are there so many Christians that are self-righteous? Right. Right. Come, Come on, amen. 
You know, it's so funny if I said, if I said, why is the world going to hell? We'd go, amen, right? Come on, right? But hey, is, it, is that true? Like, yeah, I preach it. No, 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 not, not the world. But why is it so many people? Honestly, my experience, and this sounds crazy, but this is one reason why I jumped and answered the call of God on my own life, is I want to get in like the call of God and help Christians not be self-righteous. Because so many of us and us, arrogant, and we've been in the church so long, we have a better than thou attitude. Isn't that true? Okay, it's true about your neighbor, maybe not you. But it's true about, like, better than thou, and we, like, we forget that my righteousness is anchored in Jesus and Jesus alone. We forget that on my best day, I'm still a sinner, on my best day, like when I do everything right, like I get up in the morning, I have my devotions, I treat my wife right, everything's awesome, I still need Christ, right? Yeah. And so I want to answer that, and we're going to take that question and kind of set it here and come back to it, because in a moment, kind of walk through Romans, but what we find, Paul answers that question in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1 through 3. So we're going to do like a brief survey over three chapters of the Bible. Come on. We're going to jump in. Now, here's what we're going to do for the rest of the year. Paul wrote 13 books. So after Paul was saved, he was once the persecutor, like previously on the Jesus story, or the Apostle Paul. He was a persecutor. He gets saved. And we find him, when we last left him, he was in Rome preaching the gospel. And what Paul does, he gives us 13 ancient letters. They are so, like, if you've never read the Bible, this is a good place to begin. Paul tells us how the cross and the resurrection impacts us. And, and here's what Paul does. This is why I love Pauline 13. That's a, just a scholarly word, just mean Paul, right? The apostle Paul. In all of his letters, he does two things I want you to take note of as we journey together, as we go through 13 books. And by the way, I will give you, we will provide for you a one-page summary of all the 13 books. That's not your excuse to miss church, though. Come on. But one page summary. But here's what Paul does. I love Paul. I love Paul. I've memorized probably um, of the 13 books. I bet I've memorized 10 of his books. I mean, phenomenal books. And I love Paul. Here's what he does. First of all, Paul is rich in theology. I mean, when you're reading Paul, you're going like this. Okay, I need to get a dictionary out. He's using the words like sin and wrath of God and reconciliation and redemption Words you don't use on your first date, right? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, Paul uses all these big words, but I love it. I just love it because it, all these words all have meaning and thought, and they take you down roads to help us understand what it means to be a Christian. And that's what Paul's trying to do. He's trying to help those Gentiles, us, understand what it means to be a follower of Christ. What Paul does, though, rich theology, but like without even, like even without warning, he does this. He slaps us in the face. That's what Paul does. He goes like this. We are redeemed by Christ and the glories of the heavens. And by the way, love one another. <laughs> we are a part of the body of Christ redeemed. By the way, renew your mind. Stop thinking like that. When you're reading Paul, the 13 letters, I'd encourage you to jump into it. Boy, you'll see Paul, he's like, boom! You're like, dissertation in your face. It's why I love Paul. He says that the Christian faith must impact the way you live on Monday. Amen. It, it must impact the way, and he, he's famous for this word that says, therefore. Because God is this, because we are redeemed, because we are saved, because we are reconciled, therefore, this is what we should be like. And so we're going to, for the next couple of weeks, land in Romans, and then we're going to go through the 13 books. I say the next year, I really have no idea how long we're going to be here for. Is that okay with everybody? But we're going to, we're going to be here, because I really want you to get the 13 book. The book of Romans, for those of you who dialed in, here's what the book of Romans is. The gospel is for, let's say out loud. You know the book of Romans. You can go home. Honestly, what I do when I study the Bible is I try to get the overview of the Bible in one line. We're going to give this to you on one page summaries of this. I try, okay, before I jump in, what's this book about so I don't get lost? Anyone with me? So this book is about Paul going, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the cross, the resurrection, 
Easter, right, is for anyone and everyone that will put their faith in Jesus Christ. You gotta have that kind of, kind of that bottom line beginning point. Paul gives us one famous verse that if you've been in the church for like five minutes, you've heard this verse. It kind of summarizes the entirety of the book of Romans, and here's his big famous verse of the book of Romans. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Paul says this. Again, this is like previously on the apostle Paul, he was the persecutor. His righteousness was in the law. His righteousness was in everything but Christ. And Paul's going like this. Ladies and gentlemen, I have full confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 100% my confidence is in the good news that Jesus is alive. Now, now Paul just, again, he's phenomenal in theology. I'm, I'm fully confident in Christ. He says, he says this, because of this, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. In other words, here's what Paul says, it's not by my power, not by my merit, not by my good works, not by my energy. He says, I am confident in the gospel of Christ because it's God's power that does the work. And he says, for everyone, for everyone, he says, for everyone, first to the Jew, for all the, all the Jewish people are going, yay, we're first, right? First to you, and then to those people that are not Jewish, but to the Gentiles, those sinners. Paul shouts, here's Paul, at least the book of Romans, and as we look at Galatians and other letters, Paul always comes back that the gospel works, the gospel wins, and we are about telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, this is big. This is big because it answers the question in a moment, we'll get to about 20 minutes, why are so many Christians self-righteous? But let me give you a hint. It's because we forget that. We forget that we're saved by the grace of God and God's grace alone. Now, what Paul does in Romans 1, and then we'll jump to Romans 3. He starts, he makes this big statement. Then he starts, he wants us to understand salvation, so he starts with what I call the theology of sin. And here's what Paul does. Paul says this, you cannot understand, watch this, you can't understand the good news if you don't understand the bad news. I want you to get that. Other, I think this is why so often we lose the joy of our salvation because we forget about wrath, the wrath of God, the punishment of sin. We forget all that because we've been in church so long, God's forgiven us, come on, right? But forgiven us from what and where do we come from? And what Paul would say, this is a little bit theological, he says, really to understand the power of the gospel, you have to understand the result of sin. What Paul does, if you were, how many people were here at Easter, right? You better have been here, come on, everybody, right? We talked about the four major episodes of the Bible, and we talked about episode one being creation, we were created to have a beautiful relationship with God the Father. But episode two is the fall of humanity. And I introduce you to what I call the morality ladder. This is me on Easter. Just side note, I look really good, everybody. Come on. <laughs> but the morality ladder, how all world religions are trying to, like, how do I get closer to God? How do I be a better person? How can I get up and be a better person and give back to the world and humanity? And the gospel says that no matter what we do, we fall short of the glory of God. And what the gospel is all about, it's not us, come on, climbing to God, but it's God coming down to us. Okay, that we fall short, that no matter, on my best day, there's always somebody better than me and always somebody worse than me. I am a sinner. And that's why we come together and worship on a Sunday and throughout the week, because we declare, I was once dead, but now I'm alive. Come on, Jesus is Lord. But you have to understand, I'm telling you, you have to understand this character, the morality ladder, no matter what I do, I need God's grace. And that's called the gospel. So Paul, what he does in Romans 1, he reminds the Gentile world and reminds the Jewish people that all of us, here, ready? All of us are sinners. That's hard to say amen to, isn't it? That all of us, he even says, are wicked. 
that all of us left by ourselves. And some of you go like, Pastor, like, wow, saying it like that, you know it's kind of true, right? But to say it out loud, Paul says, you gotta understand that. And Paul looks at the Gentiles, he says, the wickedness, he says, the wrath of God because of our sin is being revealed from heaven. That God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Paul says, God's wrath God's anger is coming against us because of wickedness, because of episode number two of the Bible where, where humanity fell and one bite of an apple changed everything. And Paul says sin is destructive, it brings damage, and here's the deal. Even if you're not a Christian person, honestly, if you stop and think of it, sin brings destruction and evil in our world. Now, here's the thing about sin. You know why God hates sin so much? Because sin hurts the one that God loves the most. God hates it. Because it hurts you, his creation, and me. And Paul, again, he's leading us up to the power of the gospel, but he says you can't understand the good news without the bad news, that God's wrath is coming upon us. And he says, and you know what we do? We, we suppress the truth with our wickedness, he says, that the truth of God is known, but we suppress it with our wickedness, our decisions. We suppress it with our justification. Paul says we do everything we can, to, like with Adam and Eve, is this, did, God, did God really say, and we just suppress that and suppress it and we ignore the voice of God. Now, again, some of us go, well, that's so, it's so true, it kind of hurts a little bit. But Paul says, all of us, even you Gentiles, you Jewish people, you think you can become righteous by the law? No, but you Gentiles think you can become righteous by your own effort. He says, no, we are all, we have no excuse, and he points to this. He says, because just look at creation. He says, look at creation. He didn't say, look at Mount Rainier, but how many people know that's what he really said? Come on. He said, look at everything around you. Just creation itself. Here's what Paul said. It's so beautiful language and theology that we experience God's eternal power and divine nature that you know there is a creator just by looking at his creation. That all of us, that, that there's something deep inside of us, there's a void there, a God void. We can see all around us God's power, God's glory. So every one of us are without excuse. We can't say, well, I didn't know. No, God's presence, God is chasing you. And he goes right back to the garden. You were created in the image of God. And my friend, God's chasing you. He's coming after you. He's coming after me. But what do we do? We ignore, we suppress, we sin, we are wicked. Welcome to new life, everybody. Come on, right? What do we do? Paul says we exchange the truth of God for a lie. We, we accept counterfeit. Culture. Come on, but he's talking to Gentiles at the church. Some of you go, man, that, that would be good for my neighbor. How many people know it's good for us, right? That'd be good for that sinner. No, 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 all of us. We justify, we rationalize, we exchange. We, we, we buy into lies that we know are not true because we see the glory of God around us. And again, Paul is just, wow. He's into this language that you see God's glory and power and divine nature all around us. But what we do is we counterfeit that. And we go down our own lies. And Paul says, it goes further, he says, and we worship and serve created things. And that's a creative way of saying we worship stuff rather than God. We find our contentment in things around us in the American dream. Instead of God, and, and rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. I love how Paul gets a little churchy there, Right? He says, for he's forever praised, amen. But what we do is we substitute the glory of God for our sin and wickedness and our own desires. Matter of fact, Paul says so much so that God gives us all over to our free will. And he says, all of us have free will. And by the way, this is a huge theological moment here. God doesn't force us to be in relationship with him. 
God won't force you. He'll chase you. He'll pursue you. He'll go to the cross for you. But he's not going to force you. He wants a dynamic, real, authentic relationship with you. So Paul, he says, so God gave us over to our depravity. He gave us over to our sin. And so much so, Paul points out, that the world has become, which he calls unrestrained, shameful, sexual depravity. He said, look around you, Gentiles. The world has defiled the will of God when it comes to the beauty of sex. He says, go back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. God created sexual intimacy between one man and one woman to be done in the, with a covenant marriage. But you've just gone crazy with it. Remember, I read Paul's language, he's going shameful, out of control. You know, I'll tell you, Jen and I just did a podcast on the Bible in the bedroom, and it stirred something because New Life, I'm tired of giving the subject of sexual purity over to culture in Hollywood. We need to redeem it back to the garden. I, I'm just tired of it. I'm tired, I'm just tired of our teenagers getting more information about sex and intimacy from social media than we do from the home. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of our kids being influenced and making this conversation of sex as an evil thing. It is a beautiful thing done in the covenant relationship. And Paul says, you've just gone nuts. The whole world. He said, look around you. You exchange, you counterfeit. You counterfeit the truth of God for a lie. How many people still like Paul? Come on, right? <laughs> then Paul does something that Paul does all the time. He says, if that's not bad enough, how many people that would be bad enough, right? He says, furthermore, it gets worse. Like the bad news gets bad, badder. I don't know. He says, furthermore, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do not, so they do what ought not to be done. And like, I tell you, our hearts should break when we talk about this. I think about America. I pray that God would not give up on us. Lord, give us revival again in America. God, bring back holiness. Bring back righteousness. And Paul's going, this is like what the world's gone because you, you're without excuse. Just look at Mount Rainier. Come on, you see God's beauty and glory and honor. But you've gone your own way. He says they are filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. Matter of fact, he gives a list of things that the world becomes full of. I just want to put the list up here. Look at that, right there. And by the way, there's a few more, but they wouldn't fit on the screen. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, a list. And you look at this list, and Paul's going to later on argue, we're all sinners. Come on, we all are sinners. Paul argues, if you can't find yourself on the board, you're not being honest. Come on, everybody, like, like, okay, gossip, arrogance, disobeying your parents at least once. Come on, right? Inventing ways of doing evil. We live in a day where people are inventing ways of doing evil. Again, Paul, to understand the good news, you got to understand the bad news. You got to understand the theology of sin. Paul says they have no understanding no love, no mercy, no hope. All of us are sinners. All of us need the mercy of God. All of us are in desperate need of a touch from heaven. Paul, again, beautiful. And he gets into therefore and later on, therefore love each other. <laughs> therefore renew the mind. Therefore don't be idiots. That's my word, not Paul's, right? But he says, although they know God's law, all they know, they know God's decree, those that do such things, and this is the essence of the gospel message, people that do such things deserve, come on, say it loud. 
Now, you know why we don't shout about the good news? Is we forget that news. That left by ourself, I deserve the wrath of God. I deserve God to take his hands off my life. I deserve God's punishment. And Paul's going, you Gentiles, you don't have an out because you didn't have the law. And you don't have the law of God, so you don't, so therefore, no, just look at the beauty of creation and the God conscience. And Paul says, we are all sinners. Then fast forward to chapter three, he brings a conclusion here and he says, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. He's going to all the world, no difference, you Jews, you want to be righteous because of the law. You want all your like thousand and one legalistic rules. Boom, you Gentiles, you want to know, you want to know your own wisdom. He says, there's no difference between all humanity. We all go back to the garden. We all go back to episode two where we fall. He said, there is no difference for all have sinned, and every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us have sinned. Every one of us on our best days, we have rebelled, we have hurt God, we have sinned. And the moment we forget that, we become self-righteous. The moment I live a day where somehow my own strength and my own holiness and my own character, somehow I have it all together. No, 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 no. I become self-righteous and not dependent upon Christ. He says, we have all sinned. We all deserve the wrath of God. That's why when we come together and worship, man, we ought to stand and shout to God, be the glory. That's why we never become self-righteous or arrogant or in to us, us, us. We are at the mercy of God. Paul says we are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And all of us are justified. That's a big word, just as if we have never sinned. We are justified by God freely. That means we don't pay the price. The price was paid. Come on, all of us just need to jump back into the Apostle Paul. These are good theological words and notions and meanings. We are freely saved by the grace of God, just like we have never sinned. By his grace, we don't deserve it through the redemption. He bought us back. He paid the price through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Paul would say, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile, all of us are sinners, all of us deserve the, uh, the wrath of God, all of us deserve the wages of sin, but because of the cross and because of the empty tomb and because Jesus paid the price, now we are justified before God the Father. Amen. I'm telling you, why do we become self-righteous? Because after you've been in this thing called church for a length of time, we forget that. And therefore, we lose the joy of our salvation. Therefore, we lose the joy of even telling people. We're not telling people bad news. We're telling people the good news of the gospel. And let me make an honest, that's like raw, honest confession here. I've been now a Christian 40 plus years. I got saved from a broken home. God delivered my life 40 plus years. But here's the honest confession. The longer I'm in the church, and the longer I preach the gospel, and the longer I do everything I do, and every pastor that's been in the ministry for any length of time has to be honest about this. The longer you do this, the easier it is to forget that I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was dead, but now I'm alive. The easier it is to become more professional than it is a dynamic relationship with God the Father. Paul would argue all the way through all 13 books, watch them. He said, we are saved by grace. He says, therefore, we live differently. We love people. We renew the mind. We as the Gentile world, we serve God. But it starts with this understanding. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes First for the Jew, and now to all of us called Gentiles. Come on, let's stand together. Let's stand together. Father, I pray that we would get this. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, 
Lord, I'm asking supernaturally at New Life, every location, online, every person, that the gospel would come alive. That, Father, we will remember that we are saved, that we are once dead, but now we're alive. That, Jesus, you have saved us. And, God, it's not our own self-righteousness, but it's Christ's sacrifice that we stand on. Father, I pray that the joy of the Lord, that the joy of our salvation would be our strength. I pray, Father, that every one of us, as we walk through Paul's letters, transform us, change us, renew us into the person of Jesus Christ. You may be here right now, perhaps at one of our locations, and you need to say yes to Jesus. Maybe you've drifted. Maybe you've never really given your life to Christ. Today, at this moment, if you need to say yes to Jesus, I want you without hesitation, come on, across this room, in one of our locations, raise your hand now. Come on, you need to give your life to Christ. You need to say yes to Jesus, yes. Come on, yes. Yeah. Father, I pray for those that are raising their hand now, those are identifying God that's saying, yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I've hurt the heart of God. And right now I put my faith and I put my trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. Come here, here and you say, Pastor, I just need God to restore to me the joy of the gospel. To remind me not to be self-righteous, but to be totally surrendered to the Christ sacrifice. Come on, you just need God to restore to you the joy of the gospel. I want you to raise your hand now. Come on, cross the plate, raise your hand. Father, in Jesus' name, God, that you would do your work, do the work of your grace, your power. God, we love you. Now, Father, I pray as we give our attention to worship you, that we would worship you. Take our eyes off the stuff around us. And together as a church family, we would say, God, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Amen and amen.